Welcome back to another episode of the Media Pass. I'm your host, Alex, with my other host, Matt. Matt, how you doing? Um, we, we talked about this pre-show, but me and Alex are both a little flu game, a little playing game, flu game. We um, both are suffering from allergies, which, um, at least on my part, are helping me do my job better because I can't sleep at night. <laughs> and when I can't sleep at night, I just start working. Um, that's probably something that should be sorted out by by some sort of researchers um i need to fix that but yeah allergies me and alex have them alex has them a little bit worse than me but he just took a little bit of the the what's the, the nasal the sequ- spray yeah no, yeah, okay. yeah, it, yeah. It, was na- it was real nasal spray uh what do the kids call it these days? Own? i don't know yeah whatever whatever the street name is for it <laughs> um but yeah we're, we're uh we're going through it right now uh Long night last night with the sniffles. I probably sound a little bit congested, but hey, you know, Michael Jordan did it. Why can't we? So uh, we're here. We're ready to talk about some play in basketball that is happening today. We got the West playing games tomorrow. We're going to have the East playing games. Both of us, I'm sure, are very excited. I'm sure all of you listening are very excited as well. Before we jump into the play in conversation, we got some questions. Uh, also, thank you for the support on the last episode because uh, it's one of our best performing episodes ever, which is uh, always something to celebrate. Uh, I am cracking a nice Celsius uh, in celebration of that achievement. So first question that we have, uh, by the way, there were lots of comments that weren't questions. Thank you for uh, all of the kind comments. Uh, for those of you that just wanted to voice your support uh, and not ask a question, that's always welcome too. Uh, but this question comes from Behind the Arc YT, frequent commenter, listener of the show. Thank you. Uh, this was another great episode, y'all, and appreciate y'all answering my question from the last episode. I have a new question. If you had to pick a team besides the Nuggets to make it out of the West, who would it be? Matt, I want you to answer this first. Because I think your opinion might be different than a lot of other people's opinion. It might be the same, but I, I, I'm fascinated by how you view the Western Conference. Yeah, I'm fascinated now, too. Wait, how do I view that? You're looking at me like you know something that I don't. Well, I mean, I, I say this because I, I genuinely don't know how you're going to answer this question. Because okay. in my okay. head, there's one team that I'm like, it's, it would probably be them. Yeah. But you, you're probably like, no, it's actually uh the golden state warriors and i'll be like whoa what the heck so i'll say first of all um actually i'll save this comment for one of the later questions but uh off rip i want to say the clippers um i think that they're i think they had a really really nice stretch and i think it got derailed for things that can be remedied, which is basically, I think they lost a little bit of intensity on defense. And then I think the injury bug was kind of creeping up, but I don't, I think it's one of those situations where we can't forget how it reminds me of when the Warriors won in 2022, where they were like dominant to start the season and then injuries kind of creeped up and, you know, um, it's hard to be that intense on defense for an 82 game season. And we kind of, kind of started to forget a little bit about them. Phoenix had such a strong regular season. And then obviously the playoffs came around and the Golden State Warriors won it all. Um, and I kind of see the Clippers in a similar light, but it's all kind of contingent around this knee injury that Kawhi Leonard has, the knee swelling. If that's a problem, obviously I would change my mind, but they're probably the team. I'm also factoring in like for the Timberwolves, the fact that they would have to play the Nuggets in the second round, which just makes things harder. So yeah, that's what I'm going with right now. I think, uh, it's either them or... And listen, I, I want to I want to provide a qualifier to all of this. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to factor Minnesota and OKC into our calculus here because they are wild cards. Mm-hmm. Because for all intents and purposes, this is the first time we're seeing this version of the Timberwolves at full strength in the playoffs. Like we we haven't seen them have the chance to really show us who they are yet. Um, now that they've really established their identity. So like, I'm reluctant to say the Timberwolves just because we don't have prior data to go off of. Um, And then same goes for OKC. 
very, very minimal amount of playoff experience. Great team. Both of these teams are fantastic teams, mm-hmm. not taking anything away from the quality of these teams and how good they are. It's simply, I like the known, the, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Um, and I just, I, I'm reluctant to put my answer on a team that we we haven't seen yet, uh, which kind of makes it funny that I'm going to say this version of the Dallas Mavericks would be my other pick to make it out of the West. Oh my God. Well, we're going to talk about this in a second. We're going to talk about this in a second. One thing I want to ask you real quickly. Okay. If, if Chris Finch, um, he, like he, he sent you a document swearing to you that he would not play Kyle Anderson, legitimate playoff minutes. How would that change your answer? Seriously? Seriously. Serious answer? Mm-hmm. I would probably have the Timberwolves beat on the Nuggets. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. I love you so much, man. Jesus. That is awesome. I, I'm not, I, say this, I say this because the, the numbers for Minnesota are so ridiculous. Like just about any lineup permutation without Kyle Anderson is like, yeah, it works. Like – any combination of starters, just make sure you stagger your minutes a little bit. It's like, yeah, just don't have Kyle Anderson on the floor. And like, obviously extrapolating that data over the course of an entire seven game series where there's constant adjustments and blah, 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 all this, this, that, and the third. Yes. If, if Chris Finch signed an affidavit that was like, I will not play Kyle Anderson in the playoffs, except for garbage time where we're up 50. I would say, all right, I'm betting, I'm betting my life savings on the Minnesota t- Timberwolves. That's awesome. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like 75% joking. There's 25% truth. Um, as a serious basketball, co- whatever you want to call me, as someone who takes basketball seriously, uh, I'm joking. But uh, the fan in the goofball in me says, yeah, I like those odds. Um, but yeah, the Mavericks, because... Uh, you know, we saw what they did with Luca and Jalen Brunson. Obviously, that series against the Jazz, Luca missed some time. Jalen Brunson went absolutely nuclear. Um, but I've just been, I've been fascinated by the leap that the Mavericks have taken over the last, you know, two months since the since the All Star break. I think they have answered pretty much every question that I had about them. Um, I think. While Luke is still not like some off-ball savant, I think the chemistry between him and Kyrie Irving and how they play off of each other is the best it's ever been. I am actually pretty impressed with some of Jason Kidd's half-court sets where he's like doing stuff that um, like I really haven't seen many teams. They have this one set that they run where they're in one four high, which is um, for those who are listening, um, it's like basically everyone's lined up at the top across like the free throw line um with like the ball handler bringing it up um but maybe i'll put something on screen so you can see what it looks like but all of it is to set up an iverson cut for the person on the left side of the floor um in most cases it's going to be dante exum so he'll cut across the free throw line and get a screen at each elbow um that's known as an iverson cut and then kyrie irving who is will start out on the right side of the floor will basically loop under the basket through the paint like he's making like a floppy cut um, to pop out on the other side of the floor. And what they'll do is after Exum makes that Iverson cut, they'll feed Maxi Kleba um, at the elbow. And so Kyrie will be looping around to the strong side of the floor now with, with Maxi at the elbow. And it'll look like uh, either Maxi's going to uh, pass it to him just on the wing so he can get in isolation or they're going to run a dribble handoff. And instead of cutting to get that pass or get a dribble handoff, he'll actually stop and cut to the basket while his defender is anticipating that DHO. And they get like a wide open look at the rim pretty much every time. It's one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite plays in the NBA right now. Just to put a number on it. uh, When I ran the study in on in late February, looking at how, uh, how good coaches are on ATOs compared to their relative offensive rating. So that adjusts for personnel. Guess whose team is number one in that statistic? Let's hear it. The Dallas Mavericks. 
Um, yeah, so that Jason wow. by that metric, Jason Kidd is the best at calling ATOs relative to his personnel. Number two is actually Ime Udoka. Um, fun fact. Not surprising, honestly. He's still an insanely good coach. Mm-hmm. Um, Questionable yeah. dude. Questionable yeah, dude. Right, right. Insanely good coach. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we should definitely include that qualifier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this one comes from Trey Lee, three uh, frequent commenter. Thank you for your support. Uh, obvious choice, but hero for Miami is a big wild card to me, especially since this postseason will seem to be the deciding point for his future with the Heat. My question for y'all is what are the works that you are most proud of? What videos slash articles left you feeling like I just made a freaking banger? Matt, you want to go first on that? Okay, well, so this is why I want to talk about the Dallas Mavericks just for a quick second. But honestly, I didn't want to shout myself out here because lately – so. I'll say this. One of the reasons why I knew Alex is because I watched his videos. Um, and when we started doing this podcast together, I, you know, I start first of it, some of it's you get busy. So the second part is like, you don't want to like just start echoing each other. Um, but lately I found myself last couple nights, like falling asleep, like watching some of your videos. And I got to say, dude, man, you keep up in the quality. I was watching a couple nights ago, the Jalen green and Dallas Mavericks one you did. Um, that's why I remember the exact play you're talking about. But you've been doing a, a phenomenal job with the quality of those videos. And I just wanna wanna give you your Thank flowers you. on that, man. That's what I'm yeah. proud of is getting to work with a guy like you. With Thank that you. said, with I really that said that. I, hey, no problem, man. With that said though, I think you're a lot higher on the Dallas Mavericks than me. And I can't wait to talk about it on Friday. That's fair. I, I, that's entirely reasonable. Quit dodging the question and tell us what you're proud of. That's. I mean, honestly, I, I all my work kind of just like loops together in my head. I can't even remember what I did yesterday. I'm, I think I wrote an article. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm proud. I'm honestly proud that this is my job. Um, I'm proud to call this my job. I'm very proud of that. I'll shout out something of yours that I think is like some of the most peak basketball analysis. I've ever read and consumed. I think it's up there with like people talk about um, like uh, Ben Taylor's uh, greatest peak series as like one of the pinnacles of, of basketball content. Um, I think your series uh, with, with the uh, Richard Lewis piece, um, I forget exactly what it was called, but like blazing the trail. Blazing the trail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Matt's blazing the trail series that he did for, um, basketball news. Who's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basketball news. I think that's some of the greatest basketball coverage content, whatever you want to call it. I've ever read. It was fantastic. Um, if you haven't read it, go check it out. Cause it's, it's great. Um, so I'll shout out that for you for me. I appreciate that. I don't really know. What I'm like, here's the problem with doing YouTube is I'm uploading so frequently that like I rarely get the time to like really soak in a video and like spend a lot of time with it and try to like turn it into this masterpiece just because, you know, I'm uploading two, three times a week. Sometimes it's like, okay, all of these are pretty much around the same level of like investment of my time. Uh, so I don't get to really stew with anything for too long, but pound for pound, I think probably one of the best videos I've ever done is, uh, Jalen Williams is the NBA's weirdest rookie. Uh, that's my second most viewed video ever. And I think it's probably just because one, the title and thumbnail were very, very clickable. Like, even if you're not a basketball fan, you would see that and be like, huh, why? Um, but I feel like the video just like, honestly, I, I like to think that I keep the analysis all like at a pretty baseline level of like, okay, I need to have like, I need to be this thorough in my analysis, regardless of the video. But I feel like just the way I structured that video, I was really, really happy with. So uh, that one is my answer. (laughs) Um, Moving on to the next question. We've got... 
have I been reading the questions from a different no, that's episode? Right. No, okay, right cool, cool. I got really worried there for a second. Um, okay, cool. Howdy, fellas. Love the pod. You guys are potting very well. Let's get controversial. Thank you. Are there any teams you just don't like, team rivals, players you don't like on the team, or just don't enjoy watching them? Kyle Anderson. <laughs> Sorry. I like Kyle. Kyle Anderson seems like a great dude. Mm-hmm. He just frustrates me. Um, I was thinking about this this morning, actually. I'd be like, I was like thinking about it. I'm like, you know, it's... Like objectively speaking, we're gonna do our playoff preview later this week. But I mean, if I had to bet, I would bet that Boston and Denver would be in the the finals. Um, and I think tactically, it would be like a very very good battle. I think it would move the game forward. We would get new tactics out of it, learn new things about the game of basketball. But like from a fan perspective, I'm not gonna lie, and this is like a weird weird thing because they have never won anything. But I have like I have like championship fatigue from the Celtics. I don't know why. Like it's sad because like they've never won anything. They've always just fallen short. But they've been like so like like so so good for like the last like six years. I think six seven years, however long Jason Tatum's been in the league. And I'm just kind of bored of him to be honest. Um, I would I'm not gonna lie. I'd be pretty happy if like the Knicks or the Heat or the Seventy Sixers or Magic or whoever just like upset them. You know, I wouldn't be upset about that. Um, if they're in the finals, I'm sure I'll enjoy the finals still. I'll appreciate their tactics and their great players and their versatility and all that stuff. But yeah, kind of bored with them. I'll, uh, I'll say that I I don't really like the Rockets that much. And Mm -hmm. that's because I'm an OKC fan. Um, there's just like kind of been a history of bad blood there. Um, obviously OKC is a young franchise, so it's, not like there's some extensive beef um but you know you've got the patrick beverly russell westbrook thing uh where westbrook got hurt and everyone says like okay so would have won the finals if russ doesn't get hurt and i you know i don't know how much i necessarily agree with that but you know it is a question where you're like oh what could what could they have done if he didn't get hurt and i think that's that's fair um and that's part of sports is having rivalries but it's frustrating because i actually like a lot of the rockets players like i'm a huge jabari smith jr fan oh yeah and um i i think he's awesome and i think he's gonna be really really good and i can't wait to see next year specifically um i think he probably will be one of those guys who has like a, a third year leap um, and I can't wait for that. Uh, so it's like, yeah, I don't like the Rockets, but man, they're making it hard for me to keep not liking them because I do like a lot of their players. Um, but them getting Dylan Brooks did kind of help me still feel good about not liking them. And I have like, I, it's funny because Rockets fans, if any of them listen to this and, uh, they're like, some of them are like mutual friends of mine on Twitter and uh they know i like some of the rockets players they're probably listening to this like alex how could you i i you you traitor uh and to that i say sorry <laughs> moving on to the next question wait really quick um sorry to cut you off. i just need to say this just because i you know i have to but i'm also yeah. i have championship fatigue from victor Wembanyama. i just want to say that i know he's <laughs> never even he's never even been in the playoffs he's never been on a team that's won 30 games but yeah, yeah i'm fatigued i'm already fatigued with the experience there i and I'm not uh, – I don't want to say you're anti-Wemby, but um, I'm more open to Wemby, uh, it seems. <laughs> Moving on to the next question. Uh, what are some teams you're low-key rooting for this playoffs? Me personally, I'm a Heat fan. but Oh, this is from Side Activist, frequent commenter. Mm-hmm. Shout out to him. Um, what are some teams you're low-key rooting for this playoffs? Me personally, I'm a Heat fan but love the Wolves and would enjoy watching Embiid get over the semifinals hump. Also, Alex just casually mentioning at the end that he has 10 mile runs. What a flex. <laughs> I'm training for a marathon. You know, got to gotta do what you got to do. Uh, I mean, I'm low key rooting for OKC. <laughs> it's not really low key. But like, obviously, if OKC doesn't do it all, I'd like to see the Timberwolves do it all. If the Timberwolves don't do it all. I'm kind of just like, yeah, whoever. I, I don't have a dog in the fight, honestly. After that, I'm just yeah, enjoying my, it. My uh, my sister Carly, she's uh, she likes to watch the playoffs. She loves the Heat, so I'll root for them because then I'll have somebody to watch games with um, in the deeper rounds. So you know, I root for them. 
Um, I'd like to, I'd like to see the Clippers fans feel some sort of happiness. I feel like that's a very rare fleeting feeling. I'm a huge Kings fan, like this version of the Kings. That's my most watched team this year. Um, unfortunately they've fallen apart, but I mean, if they made some miraculous run, I wouldn't be upset about it. And you know, who's fun to root for, who's fun to see happy is Jalen Brunson, man. That guy, that guy is awesome. I would love to see him kind of make a run, but I, I feel bad. The Knicks kind of screwed themselves because now they have to play the Heat or the 76ers, which is basically like a second round level of opponent in the first round when you're the second seed. So, yeah. I, I would I would say I'm going to change my answer. I'm, I'm low-key rooting for the Knicks because I've kind of been on the Knicks bandwagon all season of like, mm-hmm. if there's a team that wouldn't surprise me to make it out of the East where we're all like sitting at the end, like how did they get here? I'd be like, well, I could definitely see the Knicks doing that. Um, I, I I love the Knicks. Uh, this iteration of the Knicks. I don't love the Knicks as a franchise. They're I'm this indifferent. Is our, this is our twentieth episode, I think, of the podcast. Right, twentieth yeah. episode milestone. We've already done like three segments on Dante Divincenzo. People are going to be like, "Oh man, these big market, these big market dudes, man, they just want the clicks and all that stuff." But yeah, I mean, we're we're, we're in it. Knicks. We're in it for we're the huge. obscure players, yeah. not the yeah. not the markets, <laughs> not that like. You know, I feel like such a jerk calling like Dante DiVincenzo an obscure play. He plays for the Knicks. He's not obscure. He's he's a starter. He plays great. Like, shut up, Alex. Um, <laughs> next question. We only have uh, this is the second to last question. Okay. Um, from Ian Kernut, three three five zero, a frequent commenter. Shout mm-hmm. out to him. Thanks for answering my last question with March Madness finishing up. Who was a player that was really good in college that you thought was going to make an impact in the NBA, but did not. For me, it was Chris Dunn. I thought he was the final piece. The young Timberwolves needed to be a great team. Matt, let's hear it. Oh, what's his name? Uh, Pat Patton Patton from Creighton. He played for Creighton. He was drafted by the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, it was the Tatum year. You you do yours. I'm going to look it up. I'm the wrong guy to ask about this because I don't watch a ton of college basketball. Um, don't do a ton of draft stuff. I really liked um, Hamadou Diallo, mm-hmm. may, probably because I watched more of him just because he was at UK and I was more like exposed to his game. And I thought he was going to have, I didn't think he was going to be like a star or anything, but like he did the dunk contest and won the dunk contest and uh, thought like, oh, if he gets a three-point shot, like we got a, we got a player on our hands. Um, and he, you know, I think he's still floating around the league somewhere and uh, good for him, but I'm kind of just like, yeah, it didn't work out. I think uh, he's pretty much, it's over. Yeah, mine was Justin Patton. Patton, that's his name. Played for Creighton. Um, he, I think he was part of the, the Jimmy Butler trade, but yeah. Gotcha. Well, uh, last question from King Kyle one nine. Great pod guys, longtime fans and love everything I hear from you guys. Thank you. I'll keep my question simple. Who do you think is the worst team standing wise that you could realistically see a path to making a finals run similar to the heats last season? Probably tough to visualize without a finalized playoff tree. We have one now, just about. Uh, but was curious where you guys stood on some of the dark horses of the league. Keep up the amazing content, Matt and Alex. Thank you. You got you got um, a good answer stewing in there, or uh, I mean, wouldn't it wouldn't it still just be the Heat? It would probably uh, still just be the Heat. Yeah, maybe the Lakers. I want I want to talk about the Lakers in a second here, but yeah, maybe the Lakers. I can see the Lakers is here's the thing. Like a lot of these teams could make a run and we would do the retroactive, like, Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Like, duh. Like the Suns, for example, if the Suns make a deep playoff run, everyone's going to look back and be like, Oh, well they have, they have Kevin Durant, Devin Booker and Bradley Beal. Like, of course they weren't like a dark horse. Like they Mm -hmm. were always going to be good. And I'm just going to say right now, if the Suns make a deep playoff run, and when I say deep playoff run, I'm talking like Western Conference Finals or Eastern Conference Finals. I'm not talking like, oh, they won a series. It's not a deep playoff run. Um, The Suns, if they make it to the Western Conference Finals, I will be surprised. 
And I'm man enough to say like, yeah, I'm not going to do the whole retroactive. Oh, they had Kevin Durant, Devin Booker and Bradley Beal. It's like they've had Kevin Durant, Devin Booker and Bradley Beal, and they still haven't looked really great. Mm -hmm. They don't look like a conference finals team. So I will be surprised. They could end up looking like one, but right now they don't. Um, So I guess maybe I said like the Suns are my answer, (laughs) but again, you know, anything is possible at the end of the day. It's just the West is so top heavy, but yeah, the heat are probably still the best answer to this. The Sixers, I guess, but again, it's the Sixers. They have Embiid Mm -hmm. Embiid's going to be back. So I don't know. Sounds good. I think we should know 26 minutes into recording. I think it's time to actually get into the plan preview. Yeah. Run us through what we're, what we're looking at with the plan tournament right now. Yeah. Let's go by, um, I mean, so just real quick for anyone who doesn't know how it works is the seventh and eighth seed will play each other. Um, winner of that game gets the seventh seed. Loser of that game plays the winner of the nine to 10 seed. And then whoever wins that game gets the eighth seed. Um, there's two games today, Tuesday, we're recording it. We got Pelicans, Lakers, Kings, Warriors. And there's two games tomorrow. We have the um, Heat, 76ers, and Bulls, Hawks. And then there's going to be two games on Friday. So I think we should start in order of the way these games are going to take place. We've got the Pelicans, Lakers. I'm going to read out some stats here. So this season, they've matched up four times. The Lakers have won three. Pelicans have won once. Um, one game, the Lakers won. They had shooting variants to help them win it. And same with the Pelicans. The one game they won, they had shooting variants to win it. If anyone was curious, the Lakers won by 40 at the play-in tournament. Um, Pelicans were missing Larry Nance Jr. And the Lakers were missing Gabe Vincent. Then the Pelicans won on New Year's Eve by 20. That's the shooting variance game. They shot 50% from three, despite missing Trey Murphy the third. Lakers won on February 9th with no Gabe Vincent, Jared Vanderbilt, Cam Reddish. Um, they won by 17. And then obviously the last day of the regular season, the reason the Pelicans are in the play-in tournament, the Lakers won by 16. The Pelicans actually outshot them from three, um, took eight more three-point attempts and shot three percentage points higher. So we can't say the Lakers were a byproduct of shooting variants. Their win was at least um, a couple of injuries to look out for in this game. Lakers will be without Jalen hood Shafino and Jared Vanderbilt and Christian Wood. Anthony Davis is listed as questionable, although if he can play, I think they are going to make sure he goes. LeBron James is probable. And the Pelicans, the Pelicans, the team notorious for always being hurt, is completely healthy coming into this game. I want to say something really quickly. I feel like this series, this game is like the one I'm the most sure of out of these four. Who who do you got? I think the Lakers are going to just slap them around, dude. So I'm I'm going to say this. Mm -hmm. And I I try not, I'm talking a lot about OKC this episode, and I'm going to try not to do it after this. I hope the Lakers win this game. Yeah. Because I want the Lakers to be the seven seed. Even though I still think the Pelicans match up pretty good against the Thunder, I would much rather face the Pelicans than the Lakers because the Lakers have had their way with OKC this season. Um, and they very much scare me. Um, but I I think this goes like there's two ways this goes. It's either a Lakers blowout or the Pelicans will win in like a tight game. But Mm -hmm. I don't really see a world where the Pelicans just like blow them out of the water unless you get like a Trey Murphy game where he makes like 10 threes, like something insane like that, Um, like a big shooting variance kind of game. Um, But I still think like just from a matchup perspective, there's things that the Pelicans are going to be able to do to to kind of get their foot in the door. Um, I think something the Pelicans have done in the, in the past that has frustrated some kind of older teams, um, is when they get out and run, um, and, and let Zion like really push the pace and transition when they, when they have Herb kind of roam around and play like literally a free safety role where he's just trying to get interceptions. Um, when they like really lean into just generating turnovers as opposed to just like clamp up defense. Um, I think they, 
they can give themselves a shot. But ultimately, I think AD uh, against Jonas is going to be a bit of an issue. Um, especially anytime teams are able to get Jonas Valanciunas pulled up like away from the paint um, and kind of have him lifted up towards the three point line uh, and higher up in the half court. It's just, it's, it's free lunch. Um, teams pretty much have their, have their reign on whatever they want at the rim. Uh, and that concerns me. I think if you don't have like staunch uh, like help at the rim, um, if that's even a second late, like AD is going to find a way to get there. LeBron's going to like blow past your first line of, uh, of defense and that back line is going to be really, really strained. And then obviously um, you're, uh, it's not that the Pelicans have a bad defense. I don't, they don't have a bad defense. They have mm-hmm. a great defense, but your rotations have to be perfect, especially against a guy like LeBron, who at the ripe old age of 50 years old is still able to <laughs> knife his way to the rim and, punish over help and poor rotations with kickouts and um you know there eventually there's only so much you can do so i i don't know i the pelicans have their work cut out for them i can see them winning it i can see a world where i i'm sure everyone read the article um that was like the lakers should tank this game so that they can get the okc matchup do you have any thoughts on that the funny thing about that is, say like, the, I mean, they've been bad lately since losing Monk, but the Kings are 4-0 against the Lakers this year. What if the Kings win against the Warriors? That's very possible. We could, we're going to talk about it in a second. If DeMondis they, if Sabonis they, has never lost a game yeah, against Anthony in his yeah, entire like, we, career. You're, it, and it's just like, I don't know, that would be the most scummy, stupid, like I pray to God they lose if they, if they, if they, if they tank this game just to dodge the Nuggets. And that's like, that's the problem with this is like, I was going to ask you if you think e- either one of these teams has any legs after this plan. But like the thing is, you know, whoever wins this game is like, they have to play the Denver Nuggets and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all but inevitable at that point. But yeah, no, I think that would be, that'd just be so like, I don't even know what the word is, man. That's just like harmful to the integrity of the sport at that point like honestly i'm fine with the regular season you know i'm fine with the cleveland cavaliers playing five centers at once so they can dodge a matchup um and lose the charlotte hornets but like this is just a whole new level of of just despicable to be honest if they did something like that um i don't think they will i think that i don't know i just yeah i think that they're a really good matchup for this pelicans team that's why the west is so weird it's because like the Pelicans would mollywop. They, I mean, they have. They've beaten the Sacramento Kings five times this year, right? But they can't. They can't like. They have serious problems against this Lakers team. Whereas the Lakers can't beat the Kings, but you know they dominate the Pelicans. So it's it's funny how like you know the style makes fights and things. But um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty like like okay. Here's one thing I was looking at yesterday when I was watching the game back. I was looking at how they matched up to start the game. They had. Herb Jones guarding D'Lo because Herb can't really guard LeBron, right? They had to have McCollum on Reeves, which, you know, McCollum's had like a solid defensive season, but that's still a suboptimal matchup for him. They had to put B.I. on James. They put Zion on Rui, and then they had J.V. on Davis. And Davis obviously beasted J.V. and also made just made his life hell on the other end by sagging off him and making it so Zion couldn't do anything. But it was just like a really – because the problem here is with – the Pelicans, all their best defenders are like these wiry, long, athletic guys, not really like the Rui Hachimura type where they're just like super strong power players. So it's it makes for a very weird matchup for them. And like you said, unless like they do have like CJ McCollum who can hit 10 threes any given night or Trey Murphy can hit 10, given, 10 threes any given night. And so there's that element to it, but I'm just not not counting on that, even for the team that is the luckiest when it comes to three-point shooting. I will say this. I think if the Pelicans go into this game accepting that, okay, we're going to start Valanchunas, and if we recognize that it's not working out, we're going to pull him in the first quarter and he won't play the rest of the game. If they recognize that and they they adjust... So I, I, I think not only that, there's another aspect to it because if you look at how the Kings have kind of dominated the Lakers this season, mm-hmm. a lot of it is like they have a ton of movement. They're they're running all these off ball screens. They're using Sabonis as a DHO hub, um, and then letting obviously letting Sabonis go to work against AD. 
uh, just in the post. I think that the Pelicans have the personnel to get maybe not King's level of like off ball movement, beautiful game offense type beat, but like a a 75% version of that. I think the Pelicans have the personnel to do that. And if they accept in the first quarter that, okay, Valanciunas is not coming back on the floor. We're going to use Zion Williamson as like a pseudo Sabonis type of hub and just surround him with movement and shooters. Uh, Some might even say movement shooters. Uh, (laughs) If they accept that, this game I think looks entirely different because we've seen that the Kings – abuse the I, I I talked to Matt a little bit about this earlier on in the season after I did a mm-hmm. video on Sabonis I was like maybe it's just the Kings that make him look this bad but LeBron's off ball defense against the Kings this year has looked awful and that's not I don't think LeBron's been a bad defender this year but he has looked like a pretty much helpless defender against the Kings Um, And I think that's probably a big part as to why the Lakers have lost every matchup against the Kings this year. Um, So I think the Pelicans have a, a route to where they can, you know, have a shot, but it's whether or not they kind of accept that. And Willie green is like, okay, let's take a page out of the, out of Sacramento's book and and lean into it. And even still, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, man, like they ran some small ball with Jackson Hayes, the five, and even then LeBron was kind of able to make him pay for it on defense. So, I mean, I get the theory of it. I understand that. I'm sure they'll try to lean on that. I'll say this, this should be a big, they're going to need a big night from BI because yeah. tough shot makers like that are kind of immune to the paint packing. We saw that with that Suns Timberwolves game, like, you know, Rudy Gobert did a great job of safeguarding the paint. You could tell Suns were not getting to the rim at all. It was all just jump shooting, but like when you have great jump shooters, it, it kind of neutralizes a great rim protector like that a little bit. So I know B.I. had a really good stretch when he was playing Helio Helio ball at the end of the first quarter of that game. So maybe he could do something. I want to ask you, though, first question real quickly. This might be a quick one, might be a couple of minutes, but do you think either one of them has more than like a 10% chance of beating the Nuggets in a seven-game series? I was going to ask you the same question, a variation of that. Um Funny enough, even though I think the Lakers win this matchup, mm-hmm. I think the Pelicans have a better shot of beating the Nuggets. Why? I think, and it's it's not similar to why I think the Pelicans like could potentially have a foot in the door against the Lakers, um, even it's even though it's a smaller chance. I think the avenue by which the Pelicans can beat the Lakers is a more potent avenue to beating the Nuggets. Like just lots of putting strain on the back line of the Nuggets defense. Because I'll be honest, the Nuggets have been good defensively just by nature of coaching and positioning and like only letting certain guys end up in positions where they have to rotate and they're like understanding of their defense makes it to where like, okay, even though traditional defensive philosophy says this guy should rotate. We're actually going to have this guy rotate and the other guy just kind of stays put. Um, Because of that, that's allowed the Nuggets to be a good defense. But with a guy like Zion Williamson, good defense only really kind of gets you so far. Like good just Mm -hmm. positioning gets you so far. Uh, Because when you have a guy that's like, okay, you stick – you stick one guy on, on Zion Williamson and you're like, okay, we're going to make sure we have heavy nail help, um, lots of digging to try and slow down his drives. I think Zion's passing, we've seen it in tons of matchups this year. There was one game, I forget who they were playing, but it might've been against the Nuggets, but, uh, Zion Williamson had like seven assists in the first half. And if you go back and watch the tape, it's literally all just, oh, heavy nail help. Oh, dig off the strong side corner kick out to a shooter, kick out to a shooter, one pass away, one pass away, bam, bam, bam. Alternatively, you say, okay, well, we're not going to do heavy nail help. We're going to maybe send a help defender if we like the shooter that's in the corner taking threes, say a Herb Jones, which we'll say, okay, we're going to help off Herb Jones. We're going to have Aaron Gordon rotate off of Herb Jones um, and, and provide that help. Well, all right. 
that still only gives you a chance at defending the Zion finish because just because you send the help, we've seen Zion Williamson this year. He still might make the shot. Mm-hmm. And, he, mm-hmm. and if that if that helps even a second late, he's going to make the shot because the Nuggets have decent defensive personnel. I think it would be interesting if they stuck like a Peyton Watts. If we saw a big Peyton Watson series where they're like, okay, Peyton Watson is the Zion defender because we like his length and you know he might be able to get some like recovery shot blocks on him from behind that kind of thing i think that would be a little interesting but i don't know if the nuggets would would opt for that um all of this is to say i think zion's strengths are going to be able to be leveraged more against a team like the nuggets with a more schematic defensive approach Mm -hmm. as opposed to a size defensive approach even though the nuggets have a lot of size it's not always that size being leveraged defensively whereas the nuggets kind of leverage that size defense or not the nuggets the pelicans leverage that size defensively it's like they have great defenders but their defense is so good because they're they're so freaking lengthy and they shrink the floor really really well not because they're just like bodying guys um and shutting them down like at the point of attack uh Shout out Herb Jones, who's been fantastic. But all of that is to say, I, I think the Pelicans, even though they probably still don't win against the Nuggets, it, it's probably, like you said, no more than like a 10% chance. I like mm-hmm. the Pelicans' chances better than I like the Lakers. Yeah. I'm going to, I have a thing about the Lakers I've noticed lately. I think I'm going to hold that because for the sake of time, and plus they might just not be in the playoffs. So this won't be a relevant take, but just remind me if they're still. If they're actually in the playoffs, if they make it through the plan on Friday, to talk about it a little bit. All right. I'm, I'm marking it. Perfect. Um, so the second game we have, we've alluded to it already, Kings Warriors. They're going to be fighting to play a team for the eighth seed. They have an uphill battle. They've played four times this year and split the series. Um, only in one of those games did a team have shooting variants in their favor by a significant margin. It was the Golden State Warriors. I believe it was when they beat them. The first time this season on October 27th, they shot 44% from three. The Sacramento Kings only shot 30% from three. But um, so the first time they played Warriors won 122 to 114. They were missing Draymond Green. Sacramento was missing Trey Lyles. The second time they played the Warriors one by one. They were completely healthy, but the Kings were without De'Aaron Fox and Trey Lyles. The Kings won by one um, right after Thanksgiving. The Warriors were completely healthy. Sacramento was missing Keegan Murray, our guy. And then in their most recent game, which was January 25th, before the trade deadline, before all the injuries Sacramento had occurred, um, Golden State lost by one. The Kings won by one, excuse me, but the Golden State was missing Chris Paul, Gary Payton II, Moses Moody, while Sacramento was just missing Sasha Vizenkov. A um, couple injuries. I mentioned the injuries already, but Kevin Herter, Malik Monk out for Sacramento. Gary Payton the second is out. Draymond Green and Steph Curry were listed as probable, but they are now good to go. No injury designation. Two things I think that are super important. Um, on that January 25th game, the Kings, that they won by one. Draymond Green was coming off the bench. He just recently returned from being suspended the second time for, you know, um, right. accidentally fouling Yusuf Nurkic. <laughs> and... January 25th was right around the time Jonathan Kaminga had started coming on. He wasn't in the starting lineup yet. So Golden State hadn't discovered their kind of new version of the death lineup with uh, Curry, Clay, Wiggins, Kuminga, and Green, which has been awesome this year um, for them. So before I turn the floor over to you, um, despite being a Kings fan, I just – with Kaminga coming on now – with the injuries Sacramento's had to endure, Malik Monk, he's been such a huge part of their matchups against the Warriors this year. Um, in four games, he's averaging 13 points per game on 68% true shooting. Last postseason, he was averaging 19 points, four assists on 60% true shooting. Like He's so important as like a secondary creator. He's so fast. Nobody on their team can really keep him in front of them. He's really good at generating rim pressure, playing the two-man game with Sabonis. They're missing that. They have to deal with Kaminga now, who's like a – light version of Zion, somebody they obviously struggle defending. Green is healthy. He hasn't hurt anyone recently. I just, I mean, it's a single game. These teams know each other well. I wouldn't be shocked if the Kings lost, but I'm betting the like the Warriors here. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I, I keep thinking about is like, Steph Curry is probably going to win pl- clutch player of the year. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not doing, I'm not just doing like the whole game on the line. I want the ball in this dude's hands type thing. I'm like, this is a numbers backed thing this year. Like Steph Curry has been out of his freaking mind in the clutch. Uh, he's like most points in the clutch this year. Uh, most efficient in the clutch this year of guys on like significant volume. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, the clutch stats for Steph Curry and given all of the other matchup issues that exist between the Kings and the Warriors, uh, specifically for the Kings defending against the Warriors, um, and trying to attack the Warriors defense, which is solid, um, I just I, I don't see Steph Curry <laughs> letting letting the Warriors lose this game. Um, it's possible, but likely, I I, I don't see it. It's, the Kings are going to have to have somebody go nuclear, whether it's a Keegan Murray twelve threes, you know, De'Aaron Fox forty five points, something like that. Like it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. Obviously, anything can happen in a single elimination game where the, if the Kings get hot and they just don't miss um, and they're able to just like get that little bit of space that they need for their movement shooters, um, then yeah, I mean, this is a winnable game. It's not unwinnable. It's just if I had to pick who I realistically see winning this game, I probably would lean the Warriors. Yeah. I'll say this, um, even though I've pretty much buried the Kings at this point in my mind, I think they could be frisky against the OKC Thunder. I think they have some unique things about them. They could give them a little bit of a hard time. I think Keon Ellis is pretty good at guarding Shea. He's shown that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also like their small ball lineup. They can play with Lyles at the five and how that kind of eliminates some of the advantages of Chet Holmgren at the five. But for the Warriors... Do you think they have any prospects outside of this tournament or are you kind of buried them? So, I mean, the the only possible matchup for them is the eight, the eight seed against the thunder. Mm -hmm. Um, I think on, on the season series between the thunder and the warriors is two, two. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they've split it this year. Uh, The Draymond of it all, I think defensively, that's something that that works well for the Warriors against OKC. Um, really, what what concerns me more than like for the Warriors, and I'm I'm removing the OKC of it all from uh, you know my personal bias as much as I can. Um, the issue that I see arising is less like can the Warriors defend. OKC and like take some stuff away. I think they can. The issue is I think OKC's defense is like really, really good against the Warriors. Like what they try to do, like a lot Mm -hmm. of chasing over screens, forcing you into that in between area um, where it's like not really necessarily drop. And it kind of throws, it kind of throws guys off when they're coming off of those screens, trying to drive because they get there and they're they're coming off that screen trying to get downhill and they're like oh normally this little bit of space is here where like a guy like like Steph Curry can get that floater up and we know he can make it but with OKC just the way they operate and how like disciplined defensively they are and how much they'll have guys dig while also still having someone available to cover for the guy digging that little floater range is usually taken away so you're like okay well we got to get we got to get deeper into the paint well then yeah you are going to have a guy like Chet Holmgren waiting there oh you might even have a you might have a Jalen Williams waiting there for you who also can protect the rim relatively well for his position even Aaron Wiggins who you know uh all-star of the show um i think he's he's a very underrated rim protector for for mm-hmm. his position the, oh, yeah. the 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 point being okc just has a lot of like that in between size also with enough rim protection to where like okay golden state has to lean on the three point shot a lot but okc is pretty good at running teams off of the three point line and and defending that and and defending teams with a lot of uh off ball screening action um 
to where it's like, okay, Golden State really wouldn't be able to lean on inside the arc stuff. And OKC is kind of optimized to taking that away uh, to a certain extent. So um, it would definitely be an uphill battle. I, yeah. As an OKC fan, I would probably rather see the Warriors. But again, the caveat with OKC anytime we talk about them is playoff experience matters. It's always going to matter. It has always mattered and it always will matter. Um, so like there's a world where OKC gets there and they do what the Cavs did where it's like, the lights were brighter than I expected. So uh, the brights were too you know, light. Yeah, the brights were too light. That's a good insight. That's going to be a running bit from now on. Yeah. I was going to say um, another thing I've, I've really concerned with with the Warriors is like that balance between defense and spacing. It's funny to think about spacing with the Warriors because like they were like you know the guys who like invented spacing. But like like I looked their starting five. It's like Curry, Clay, obviously you know two very venerable shooters. But then after that, it's Wiggins, Kaminga, Draymond, all below average shooters. And it's like, yeah, they're great defensive trio. But like that's going to be really easy for a team like OKC to like, you know, pack the paint, make things tricky on them, force them into a lot of tough shots. Like you said, they're really good at um, chasing ball screen, off ball screens and all that stuff. So that's an advantage of theirs. And then it's like. So what the Warriors might end up having to do is sacrifice all the great stuff they have on defense with that five-man unit and put in Brandon Pajemski for Andrew Wiggins or put in Dario Saric for Jonathan Kaminga. And then it's like you lose all that defense then. I just feel like they can't find a balance that could um, really compete with a team like OKC who has just so much balance. A couple stats I will say that are interesting, worth monitoring – um, before we head over to the East, Warriors are 28 and 15 since Draymond came back from suspension, fifth in net rating. And then I think I've talked about this a couple times. Um, a study I did about past champions, and in the last 20 years, um, 18 of the 20 champions, the two exceptions were Warriors teams that were repeating, but 18 of the 20 teams had at least one five man unit that had a plus nine point differential or higher per 100 and had played at least 300 possessions, a five-man unit comprised of most, if not all, their best players. The Warriors have two of those lineups, okay? They have their Curry, Clay, Andrew Wiggins, Green, Kuminga lineup, played 337 possessions. They're a plus 18. And then when you take out Clay Thompson and put Brandon Pajemski in that five-man lineup, they're still a plus 12 and a half. So they do have some nice indicators, um, but... I don't know, man. Not every team, not every team can be a contender, unfortunately, and right. they do have to play a very good Thunder team. I, I'm going to say this too. A lot of people talked last year about, and this is not about this specific series. A lot of people kind of complained last year about how there were very few upsets. Like we had the one eight upset with Milwaukee mm-hmm. in the Heat, but other than that, I, if I recall correctly, it was all pretty. Um, you know, not predictable, but, um, I, I feel like it's such a mean, compl- stupid complaint. We had the heat, the heat weren't upset the whole time. Yeah. And it's, it's like there, the, the seedings broke the way they did for a reason. It mm-hmm. was not coincidence. I think the Knicks obviously upset the Cavs, but the four five matchup, it, it's, you can't really ever call that an upset. Mm-hmm. I just don't think that's realistic. It's not an upset. Um, because they're just so close in the standings. This year, I see less likelihood for 1-8 matchups, but a higher likelihood for like 2-7, 3-6 kind of upsets. Um, That seems more plausible as opposed to last year where it was like, yeah, you had the 76ers facing the Nets in the first round. It's like that's the 76ers are going to win that. Yeah. Um, and then out West, it was like the Kings and the Warriors, which, th- you know, that was an upset, but ultimately it was a series that came down to the wire and, um, it, it was basically 50, 50, it could have gone either way. You really saw an avenue for both teams to win. So, um, moving on to the East, what do we got? You want to set the table for us here? Yeah, of course. I'd love that. Um, so we have, this one's weird because, the Heat and 76 just played four times. They've split two and two times. Each team's won twice. But the Heat's two wins are the two games Jimmy Butler was missing. So on Christmas, they played. Um, this is pre-trade deadline, so we don't have the Buddy Heald. You don't have Terry Rozier. 
Heat win by six. Um, the Heat were missing Butler, Highsmith, and Josh Richardson, who they'll also be missing for this game. And the 76ers were missing Batum and Embiid. There was no shooting variance in this game, no real shooting variance um, between the two teams. There none in the four games they played. On Valentine's Day, they like to play each other a lot in holidays. The Heat won by five. We're missing Butler, Rozier, and Richardson. The 76ers were missing Covington, who they'll also be missing for this game. Embiid, Tobias Harris, Kyle Lowry, and DeAnthony Melton, who they looks like they will also be missing for this game too. And then on March 18th, the 76ers won 98 to 91. The Heat were missing Hero, Love, Richardson. 76ers were missing Covington, Embiid, Melton. And then on April 4th, I actually watched this game pretty recently. The 76ers won by four in a game that pretty much got them the seventh seed. Um, the Heat were missing Hero and Richardson. Philly was missing Covington, Tobias Harris, to Anthony Melton. Just to, because I know I said a lot at once about injuries, the Heat are for sure going to be without Josh Richardson. Um, Terry Rozier, Duncan Robinson, and Kevin Love are all listed on the injury report because they missed the Raptors game. I don't know what that means for their status. I, those guys are kind of important, so hopefully they play. Um, Philly is going to be without KJ Martin, without Robert Covington, and Bede's good to go, it looks like. And then it looks like they're going to be without Melton. So that's going to be interesting. Um, what are your initial thoughts on this game? I just have a hard time with the heat in general, just because there's not like an easy way to evaluate this team. Like anything, can, we know anything can happen, which is frustrating because like on paper, I don't think the heat are a particularly like great basketball, like on paper to me, a fully healthy, a fully healthy 76ers team is much better than a fully healthy Miami Heat team. Wouldn't you say this, though? This year's Heat team is on paper better than last year's Heat team? Yeah. Which, which is crazy. Like, what? <laughs> it doesn't... It, it's frustrating because, mm-hmm. um, you know, Jaime Jaquez is probably going to average 27 points per game and shoot 50% off the catch uh, from three in this, in this game. Uh, and... Some guy who they drafted or picked up from the YMCA at uh, thir- about 30 minutes ago is going <laughs> to drop 50 points. Like, it's just, it's an inevitability. But really, I look at this and I'm like, yeah, the 76ers shouldn't lose this. Hmm. But again, it's the Miami Heat. Uh, I don't really even know how to approach this game other than kind of looking at it as who has a better shot against the Knicks. I think the, I mean, he, I, to me, the heat have shown, they know how to beat the Knicks and they know how to out physical them. They know how to deal with that. They have, they have more spacing than them. I mean, at least last year's team, Matt, we'll see how it's different with OG on Anobi, but minus Randall this time. It, I don't know. Who, who would you want to play if you're the Knicks? If I'm the Knicks, Mm -hmm. I would much rather play the 76ers. I agree. I think one thing. I still think that's a series that could mm -hmm. kind of be a toss up. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not pretty. It's not the Pacers. It's not the Magic. Um, It's not the Cavaliers. You know, I'm sure they much rather would have played one of those three teams, but for some odd reason decided they weren't going to do that. They were going to play Dante DiVincenzo 50 minutes. Um, But yeah, I mean, see, I think people are underrating how big of a deal it is that D'Anthony Melton might not be able to play this postseason. He is their best perimeter defender. And I mean, I know like, so when I going back to the game, I watched um, this, the heat in the half court could not get to the rim when Embiid was on the court. He was awesome. Usual brand of awesome rim protection. The thing is though, like, we know conditioning can be a problem with him. We know he's dealing with an injury. We know he's already going to be asked to do a lot on the offensive end. Do you really want him to have to be Rudy Gobert out there in uh, 2021 where he's got no perimeter defense and he has to protect the entire like, court? Like, do we really want that for him? Like, right. I, I know I'm, maybe I'm overstating, you know, Kyle Lowry has been solid. 
um, since signing with the 76ers, Kelly Oubre. He, um, he's another all, all defender, uh, theatrical team in terms of like how he'll get in his stance and then get blown by immediately. Um, Tobias Harris, you know, he's Tobias Harris. Nicholas Batum was a very good defender. I don't know how much of that's left in the tank. Robert Covington won't be part of this postseason. I'm pretty sure like, they, their their defense outside of MB is pretty worrisome to me, um, and they're going to be asking a lot of him, which is problematic because he's coming back from a pretty serious injury. Um, I like I like the I like the way him and Maxi have looked together since Embiid's come back. Maxi had a great game against the Heat. Um, he looked awesome. They tried to put Terry Rozier on him, and it was just like no bueno. Um, they eventually put Highsmith on him and Martin and Jimmy Butler and all this stuff, but he was already too hot by that point. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't see like I think there's some people that are just a lot higher on the 76ers than me right now. I'm pretty worried for them if they don't get Melton back. So if I was the Knicks, I'd I'd want to see them. I think I think it says a lot that like this the fact that I, I'm not super high on the 76ers. Like, mm-hmm. yes, there's a world where they go on a deep run, and I'm like, okay, fair enough. Um, you know, Embiid's Embiid, and if everything clicks right for him, then yeah, it can totally happen. But I think it says a lot about the heat that we're like, you know, they might lose, they might lose to the 76ers. And then we kind of get to the nine ten matchup. And it's like, I could see the heat losing the nine ten matchup because I have, not only do I have some thoughts on the bulls, but I got some thoughts on the Hawks. You have some thoughts. And we're we're going to actually talk about that game. I don't have like extensive thoughts, <laughs> but I uh, am I crazy for feeling like. Uh, let me say this the Hawks are one of two things. They are either A, a bad team disguised as a, a bad team cosplaying as a good team, or a good team cosplaying as a bad team. The Hawks, I'll say this. I think I've said this on the pod already, but please like stop me if I have. I think this offseason, if they trade one of those one of the guards, they'll be like really good next year. I think like they yeah. have Jalen Johnson, they have have you seen Vit uh Kravchi play basketball? Vit Whatever Krejci, 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 he's a OKC baller. Dude. Legend. Yeah. He's a baller. Okay. You have um Boyan Bog- I mean Bogdan Bogdanovich. Great six-man microwave player. Kobe Bufkin's coming along. I don't get why they don't play um, A.J. Griffin more, but he's he's actually secretly really good, and he's just hiding there in his bench, on their bench. Um, DeAndre Hunter's been solid this year. Like, they, if you just, like, let Trey Young or DeJounte Murray, like, you know, be the lead creator and then put as much shooting and defense around him as possible, the Hawks are like a 50-win kind of team and that's what they looked like when murray was uh, i mean uh when trey young was on the shelf not a 50 like a 45 win team but once you get the assets back for trading them and all that stuff so no you're i don't think you're crazy for thinking this hawk there's more to this hawks team but and also i'll save what i think about the hawks well let's let's wrap up real quickly this 76ers heat thing so Okay, so if Philly if Philly was to be the seventh seed, who are you taking in a Knicks Philly series off the top of your head right now? I think the Knicks' ability to put it in the mud mm-hmm. with Embiid coming off of an injury. I don't. I, I, I'm not. I am not saying at all that like the Knicks would like intentionally try to hurt Embiid or anything like that. Please mm-hmm. do not construe this as me saying that. Uh, those listening right now, I think Embiid's strengths would be pretty limited in a series that gets as in the mud as I imagine the Knicks would try to make it. Um, and we know that the Knicks thrive in the mud. They, they like to roll around in it and uh, Jalen Brunson will put up 50 on you uh, when you, when you get in the mud. So um, mm-hmm. I just, re- I really like the Knicks ability to make kind of Teams that don't like to get uncomfortable, they make they make those teams uncomfortable. They find your your biggest insecurities and they insult them constantly until they've beaten and battered you down uh, till they win. Um, which is why I love the Knicks so much. They're so fun. Uh, so, different different episode of the pod. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
We'd be the first people to do something like that. Talk about the Knicks and just give them love. Um, right. We'd be, we'd be the Small first Small market podcast. teams never get that. <laughs> they don't get the respect they deserve. <laughs> okay, so what if the Heat win? Who are you taking? That's where it's like, oh, you have two teams that thrive in the mud. Mm-hmm. And the Heat, <laughs> and, are like, they're the kings of the mud. Right. And, and, and I mean, record-wise, you look at the difference – it's a four game win difference it's mm-hmm. not like uh, record wise obviously there's a lot more that goes into it than just win loss but like record wise the difference between the heat being the eight seed and being the two seed was four games you know they could have been where the knicks are if the cookie crumbles a little bit differently um i would still probably take the knicks i think the jalen brunson of it all in my opinion I think the Knicks have the best player in that series. And Mm -hmm. when a series is in the mud like that, I kind of err on the side of like, okay, whoever just has the best player is like probably going to be able to just get willed to victory. Um, And we saw Jalen Brunson last year take it to six. Basically, I don't want to say single-handedly, obviously. No basketball game is won single-handedly. I say that with like an asterisk behind it because there are examples of that but um in a seven game series i probably would take the knicks interesting i I just worry about josh hart and we'll talk more about this when we preview um on friday but do you think before we wrap into the next series do you think either one of these teams has a chance a chance of beating the boston celtics in the first round the heat more so than the sixers but ultimately I i would say I'm I'm kind of in the boat of like the Celtics are overwhelming every team pretty much. It's I, I people I think we're going to look back on the season that the Boston Celtics have had and and really understand wow, this team was insane. And we kind of went I, I preached about it on my channel, but like I, I don't know if people really understand what we've been watching like this. That's an, it's an insane basketball team that I think barring injury will be able to just overwhelm any like shooting variants. Like they just have the extra stuff that they need uh, mm-hmm. over the a single game, different discussion, but over a seven game series, I just don't see it for any other team Interesting. in the East, in the East. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. Put a pin in that. Put a pin in that one. Let's talk about the 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 rumble in the jungle, um, the malice, the malice in the palace. That's not even the right reference. I don't have anything more clever to say. But we have the Hawks and Bulls. Okay, Hawks and Bulls, <laughs> Murders Row. They've played three times this year. <laughs> the Bulls have won two of those three matchups. Um, the Bulls, in one of their wins, had a significant advantage in shooting variants and then the Hawks in their one win had a significant advantage in shooting variants. They played the day after Christmas. The Bulls won by five. They're missing Zach Levine and Nikola Vucevic. The Hawks were missing DeAndre Hunter and the God, the God amongst men, Vit Krejci. Krejci. Um, and then on February 12th, the Bulls won by 10. Chicago was missing Zach Levine. Atlanta was missing Wesley Matthews. This is the game Chicago shot 46% from three compared to Atlanta's 33%. And then a game I watched on April 1st, the Hawks won by 12. Um, the Bulls were missing Javante Green, Zach Levine, Julian Phillips, Patrick Williams. Atlanta was missing Sadiq Bey, Anyeke Okongwu, Trey Young. Jalen Johnson was coming off the bench. The Bulls shot 25% from three, and the Hawks shot 48% from three. In this game, Atlanta will be without Jalen Johnson and Anyeke Okongwu. That Jalen Johnson won's a huge blow to me. And the Bulls will be without Zach Levine, Patrick Williams, of course, obviously, tragically, Alonzo Ball, Julian Phillips, and then Io Sunmu and Andre Drummond were listed on the injury report as questionable. I imagine Io will for sure be going. I think he was just listed on there because he didn't play on Sunday for rest reasons. And Drummond's a little bit more worrisome and very important to this game, I feel like, given how Atlanta likes to crash the glass. So from our earlier conversation, are you picking Atlanta here? Oh, wait, really quickly, who do you think is going to win the Philly-Miami game? I, I think Philly wins. Okay. I'm going Miami. Cool. Sweet. Yeah. We keep it we Go. keep it interesting. We didn't say the yeah. same thing. That's good. Um 
So moving on to Bulls and Hawks, Mm -hmm. I think of all the play-in games, this is the most toss-up to me. Yeah. Which I I guess like you have two bad teams. Sorry, excuse me, excuse me. Two theoretically bad teams playing Mm -hmm. against each other. Both of these teams have been like had their moments where we're like, oh, Bulls, like we have the Ewing theory going on with Levine and the Bulls where it's like Mm -hmm. they might be better without him, uh, which different pod. I see a world where we get like a Kobe White game and like we kind of see the the first iteration of uh, a Kobe White in an elimination setting where he's like a primary option. And like we talked about the Steph Curry of it all with the clutch stuff. Mm. Same thing can be said for DeMar DeRozan. And shoot, I mean, you look at the Knicks versus Bulls game that happened just the other day. It went to OT. Like the Bulls almost won that game. Like the Bulls, the difference between the Bulls probably being like a 45 win team versus a 39 win team is like, does DeMar DeRozan hit just like a few more shots in overtime or not in overtime and uh, like in the last two minutes of a game over the course of the entire season, he makes like four or five more clutch shots than he did. They're probably like a 43, 44 win team. Um, so like the way the cookie crumbled for the Bulls, especially at the beginning of the season, if we have this version of the Bulls over the course of an entire season, I think this is a team that is either right at 500 or slightly above 500 basketball. Right now they're a below 500 basketball team. I think they're probably better than the Hawks just from like a a coaching perspective and just overall scheme and cohesiveness. That's not necessarily saying like the Bulls are some beautiful, beautifully executed basketball team. It's just, I think they have more cohesiveness and play better together than the Hawks do at times. Um, But again, like the Hawks, you know, might be a good team pretending to be a bad team. We don't know. So I just view it as a complete toss up. Yeah, I think the Hawks have a couple things working against them. I think Jalen Johnson, he causes so many problems to the Bulls because of his functional size, his athleticism, his passing, um, his burgeoning pull-up jumper, all that stuff. I think it's just going to be so hard for Atlanta to replicate, and it was such an advantage with Chicago missing Patrick Williams for the rest of the season. And then I also think you know um, the – Subtraction by addition is going on in Atlanta now that Trey Young's healthy. Whereas, like I thought, they finally found like lineup balance only having one of the guards and then going with again, like I said, shooting defense length around them. Whereas, I think the two of them is going to, you know, it's a single game, and th- this is I'm talking more of like a season long kind of sample size. But I think it'll maybe bleed a couple points in this game that could hurt them. The one thing Atlanta does have going for him, and shout out to Steph No, he did a great preview on this for Sporting News. But Atlanta takes a shit ton of threes, which like gives you like like a lot of variance in performance. So you could be like it raises your ceiling and lowers your floor when you shoot a lot of threes. Whereas the Bulls are kind of like married to like their you know average expected outcome because they don't shoot too many threes. It's a lot of Demar Derozan mismatch hunting. Um. So I know Atlanta has that. They could just get really hot, hit a bunch of threes, and you know, win that way. But I'm I'm kind of leaning Chicago. I think Caruso and Io do a really good job of defending Trey and Dejounte. I think that Atlanta's team just doesn't fit as well as this like you know this kind of scrappy Chicago group that's by the way 34 and 29 I believe since starting the season five and 14. So and yeah, you got Demar Derozan. If it's late, close game, he'll just mismatch hunt you mid range. And Atlanta's not long enough or athletic enough right now to really bother him in the way that better teams can. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's even much more to say than than that. There should be. Do you, do you think? <laughs> so say the Bulls win, they win, right? Do you think that like I don't think that if the Seventy Sixers play the Bulls, I think the Seventy Sixers is going to really like all business, strictly business, like just stomp them. But I feel like the heat might like just, they might fuck around and just lose that game on accident. Oh yeah. I I can see that for sure. And 
you know, for all the criticisms of the Bulls, mm-hmm. I, I do think Billy Donovan has done a good job with the yeah, hand that he's, he's been dealt. Coach. He's a good coach. And that would be a game where, like, I think we see, like, the whole chess match thing, mm-hmm. um, even though I kind of think that, like, little quip is overused now. Um, but, yeah, I think we could see, like, Eric Spolstra and, and Billy Donovan, like, throwing the kitchen sink at each other and just, like, slinging poop at each other. It would be hilarious to watch that. Um, just you talk about in the mud game, that would probably be one where it's just like, what on earth are these guys doing? Like junk defense galore. Uh, hmm. So, yeah, I agree. I think the 76ers would come in and it would be strictly business. Um, obviously, anything can happen. But the Heat, yeah, I definitely see a world. Because it almost happened, what was it, last year? Yeah, like, they almost lost. Yeah, they almost, they, it was they almost lost. <laughs> it, was it was the was same the, the situation, only, basically. Yeah, they, they got Max Struess got hot. That was pretty much it. He just got really hot, and they, they won that way. But um, yeah, this whole heat thing would have never happened. The legend of Jimmy Butler w- might not even be near what it is right now if it wasn't for Max Struess. So he should buy him some Chipotle. <laughs> um, one other thing I think I should mention really quickly is if Andre Drummond ends up not suiting up, I feel like that changes things. Um, yeah. yeah they need his size. Yeah, they do, especially against Capella and their offensive rebounding. I will ask you, Alex, do you think do you think there is a more than 10% chance that the Bulls can take two games from the Celtics in a seven-game series? No. Okay. Wow. No. How bad will it be? This could be like massacre. Um I think every game except for one or two would probably be decided by 10 or greater points. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of there with you. So the Hawks are a different story. Um, the Hawks are probably foaming at the mouth to get Boston because I don't think realistically they upset Boston, but Mm -hmm. they would do like, you know, we may not win, but we're going to make it as hard as possible for you. It'd be like 143 to 129 every game. Right. Yeah, for sure. And Trey Young would have like, 17 assists which i i want that's the series i want i want to see the celtics and the hawks match up because i think it'd be fun and it'd be i'd be so you, it'd be hilarious you'd be happy with one of the 76ers of heat not being in the playoffs this year so your hawks without jalen johnson could be against the celtics i view it as like the celtics are like the juggernaut mm-hmm. and i want to see the celtics have like not the toughest the toughest shot but like I want to see them be battle tested by the time they get to the finals. I want to see them have to go through like the gauntlet uh, mm-hmm. and like show everyone like, yeah, this isn't the team that uh, goes down like three, one, a series like this or three Oh, in a series like this is a team that can just demolish people. Um, and I want to see them do it against the teams that they maybe match up worse against the worst against. Um, so if that means, yeah, like the 76ers or the heat aren't in the playoffs, then because I, I think they probably manhandle the Heat this year. And they probably manhandle the Sixers. But the Hawks, for some reason, I, I say for some reason, hmm. um, the Hawks just will do whatever it takes to beat the Celtics for some It's It's the funniest thing. Um, but, yeah, either way, I mean, all of this is to say that you're just writing your own death sentence to the Celtics, I think. Hmm. So I think that's going to do it for our play-in special. As always, be sure to ask us some questions, and we'll answer them at the top of next episode. Uh, Thank you all so much for watching, listening, whatever platform you're on. Be sure to follow, subscribe, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, whatever, uh, all the different apps that are out there. Um, Leave a five-star rating if you enjoyed it. Uh, Leave a five-star rating even if you didn't. Uh, as always, follow us on Twitter at Alex Hoops underscore at Matt Issa 15. That's M A T I S S A 1 5. Thank you all so much for watching. Matt, you got anything you want to say before we close out? Um, I love you, America, and all the other countries that listen. I couldn't have said it better myself. We'll see you all next time.